mean the tour of this. <laughs> She is a rooinek, she can't help me. Span a draad. Translate to English. Good evening and welcome back to One Step at a Time Farmstead. I'm Lucas and I'm so happy that you are here with us today. Joining me in our kitchen tonight is my beautiful wife, Daniel. Tonight we are going to do the preparation work for making some bolton, for preparing some bolton. Now it's just one thing that I've noticed what people call traditional bolton and then they add stuff like Worcester sauce or what the British will call Worcestershire sauce or what the Americans will call Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> okay, who's this one? And you know, a couple of other ingredients which isn't really traditional. Now, Bolton is one of uh, South Africa's favorite traditional snacks. Actually, it has its origin from the Dutch uh, and German settlers in 16, 1652, I think, when. I apologize, but I had to interrupt myself here for a moment. In order to understand the development of Biltong in South Africa, one has to understand the early history of South Africa as well, and the influence that the Europeans had on the development of Biltong. In 1488, Bartolomeo Diaz was the first European to travel around the southern tip of Africa in an effort to discover a trade route to the Far East. In 1497, Vasco da Gama also rounded the Cape and went past the Cape of Gudo, past the Great Fish River, where Bartolomeo Diaz earlier turned back, and then he sailed all the way north to Zanzibar and then east to India, and so established the Cape route between Europe and Asia. In 1652, Jan van Riebeek established the Dutch Cape Colony uh, for, the, for the United East India Company with Freie Burgers or Free Citizens. A uh, majority of them were Dutch and there were also some Germans. In 1688 they were joined by the French Huguenots that were fleeing persecution from King Louis XIV. And from these three nationalities is actually where the Bura Afrikaner full is descended from. In 1795 the British uh, seized command of the Cape Colony to prevent it from falling into French hands. But in 1803 power was given back to the Dutch but the British uh, seized it again in 1805. Now the free burghers or some of the free burghers refused to live under imperial rule and decided to move inland. Between 1806 and 1835 uh, smaller groups of the Boere folk moved inland and from 1836, a large number of the Bura decided to migrate inland to establish an independent sovereign nation state. And this track was named the Groot, the Groot Track or the Great Track. The Bura then established the Republic of Natalia, the Republic of the Urania Free State, and the South African Republic or the South African Republic, or also known as the Republic of Transvaal. 1652, I think, when Jan van der Riebeek actually started the Cape Colony. Basically, ships coming from Europe at that stage didn't carry a lot of livestock, but they did bring some meat that was salted and then prepared on the ships as they traveled abroad to South Africa and you know that was prepared on the on the ships. Now uh, what made Cape Town or South Africa so important at that stage is because it was the spice route between Europe and India. The Cape Colony or the southern end of South Africa at that stage which is you know, the Cape Cape Town is, you know, it was like a 
halfway stop for the merchants when they travel and eventually um, it ended up like the, one of the major trading posts between Europe and, and India or Europe and the East. Um, okay, and from there, okay, we all know, well, not all of us know, but um, it happened that, you know, the Europeans settled in Cape Town and uh, basically the British came and colonized uh, the Cape Colony again and so, uh, that's where the Bura uh, Afrikaner uh, people basically came from and they refused to accept the rule um, under English imperialism and asked you know, to move inland to be a self-governing nation um, which was essentially agreed upon by the British and from there, from you know, Cape Town, they moved north uh, to what was then known as Transvaal and KwaZulu Natal, Natal, KwaZulu Natal today. And um, yeah, basically, um, they were kind of like the pioneers of South Africa, very likened to the American pioneers of you know of America. Um, and they trekked with uh, oxes and wagons over the Drakensberg uh, Plateau. What's that in English? Plateau. So, uh, yeah, basically, and uh, they also had to find ways to preserve their food. Obviously, there was some game along the way that they hunted uh, and stuff like that, but um, most of their food they had to, pre had to preserve in such a way that they can uh, survive during this long trek um, and move uh, from Cape Town to the north to settle in Transvaal, which is today known as Scouting. Um, and the free state and stuff like that um, and that is basically where Bolton has its origin. Uh, it's that salted meat like the Dutch and the Germans prepared on the ships but then spiced um, you know, with um, some spices to make it more flavorful and palatable. And, and that is why Boltong is so unique to South Africa and how it differs, differs from other cured meats all around the world. Um, it's kind of like, in a way, like, you know, the Americans would call jerky, but it's also so far removed from jerky as you can imagine. Um, okay, like I said, I saw some recipes and uh, people uh, uh, sharing re recipes saying it's traditional, uh, but it's actually so far removed from traditional, you know, with the ingredients as, you know, one can find. And this cookbook is one that I inherited from my grandmother on my mother's side. Well, my mother inherited it and I inherited it, you know, again from my mother. Um, and this cookbook was written in 1955. Um, they actually have the specific date here. I think the 29th of August. Sorry, it's, it needs a bit of attention. Was I showed them? No. Okay. Oh, the book is old and it needs a bit of attention to bring it all back together again. Yeah, um, the first edition was in uh, on the 29th of August, 1955. So it's basically a decade after the Second World War that this book was published. And basically to prepare Bolton, you need four basic ingredients, which is meat, either beef or uh, uh, game, venison. Venison is most of Veal is most a young bull, of course. Like, yeah, that's me. Yeah. Yes, okay, yes. Oh, so uh, venison, any game animal basically will do, or beef. Um, I'm, I've had shark bottom before, um, and I've had bokoms, which is salted herring, uh, very much like the uh, uh, Swiss prepared way back then, uh, which is a fermented salt and dried um, airy fish, but anyway, um, but I've never s seen people use sheep or pork to prepare bolton, and I'm not actually well. I I haven't seen bolton. I haven't seen people use bolton or sheep or lamb or pork. But yeah, um, basically you, one of the ingredients is beef, which is very popular, or game, whether it's kudu or um, antelope or springbuck or nyala or <laughs> yelant or basically any game 
game go, even um, our Wild Hawk or War Dog, Bush Speed, any game. So I don't know why they don't do it with Lamb or Pork. I'm sure there is a reason, but okay. we've, we've actually had Bacon Bolt on Bacon before. Bolt on with pork, yeah. But Bacon again is smoked, so it's more jerky than it is built on. <laughs> Four main ingredients is your meat. In this case, we will use beef, two kilograms or, you know, roughly four pounds uh, of beef. And we are using the silver side uh, roast basically for that, uh, that we will um, cut to make built on. Then salt, because it's cured in salt. Uh, and we will use this true Himalayan pure salt. Uh, you can use sea salt. And the coarser your salt, the better at the end of the day. Then the other main ingredient is uh, coriander seed. Um, also, you can use it just as it is, or you can roast it a bit, you know, if you prefer that taste. And then black pepper. And that is your basic ingredients for preparing bolto. Um Some people will make a vinegar brine and they will marinate it in the vinegar brine and um, all that, but that is not truly the traditional way to do it. Um, I believe that is preference from their family that was carried over to the next generation. Um, but the true traditional way is basically to have it salted and spiced and then hung to, uh, to dehydrate, to dry basically. Um, and then it's preserved and it will last you indefinitely. Then again, this is your basic recipe so you can adapt that to your specific taste if you want to add a, 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 a very popular um, spice to add a, as well is fennel and also some uh, chili pepper cayenne pepper or, um, you know something like that to give it that a bit of a pop and I, I enjoy a bit of a spicy uh, taste to my bolton but with this recipe we are going to stick to the traditional no brine in a vinegar solution we will salt it and spice it and then leave it overnight you know uh, turn it every 6 to or 12 hours you can leave it for longer but um, preferably to leave it overnight for about 12 hours is uh, sufficient okay so in this recipe recipe Danielle will go through the ingredients with you and all the measurements and then she'll grind it up okay so 30 grams coriander yes okay 125 gram pink Himalayan salt and 7 grams coarse black pepper. She's going to basically grind, roughly grind, the black pepper and coriander seeds. So basically till you get this consistency in your spices. Okay, you can add a bit more black pepper if you want to. You can add something like uh, fennel seed or mustard seed if you pre uh, prefer. Um, we are going to stick to the basic recipe. Yeah, basically if you want to do a big batch um, of your Bolton spices, it's basically for every pound or half a kilo of uh, salt, you will use half a cup of coriander seed and a tablespoon of black pepper. No? Yes. Okay, and that's it. You can add chili pepper, uh, dried chili pepper, um, if you prefer. Are we going to add some chili or you want to? No, I think just, just like this. Yeah. I wonder if we shouldn't add a bit more black pepper, but again, this, this smells mm. awesome. You can add mustard seed, you can add fennel. Or... This recipe should be fine for about two kilograms. What we've got here, yeah, two kilograms of meat that we've got here. So what I will do, okay, we can actually mix all of this together now, or we can first do the salt. Okay, let's mix this all together. So 
after mixing the salt and the spices, I'm just going to add a small layer. You have the bottom. When you, okay, sorry, our meat's already been cut, but when you uh, cut your bottom slices up to an inch, about two, two and a half centimeters or an inch is preferably the best. This one is about, I'll say two centimeters, maybe a bit less, one and a half centimeters in thickness. But sit, sit. Six, move. And then we'll, this in here. And we'll layer it like this. Another little uh, five feet. And also, South Africans will have a strong opinion about this, and th that is that the best beef for Boltong is yellow fat beef, which means yellow fat beef is pasture raised beef. This, unfortunately, is you can see it's grain fed, uh, you'll see the, the white fat on here, which means it's grain fed beef. Unfortunately, we don't have the space to raise our own beef uh, yet, but we are. We'll get it. We are getting there one step at a time with everything that we do. That's what it's called, one step at a time. <laughs> but yellow fat or pasteurized beef does make the best salt on. And yeah. every, every single South African will vouch for that. If I can just show you here on this piece as well, you can see the white fat strip on here. If that's yellow fat, you are the master. And there we go. Okay, this rock salt will extract the moisture uh, from the beef. And every six hours or three to six hours, we will basically just come and turn the, the meat, you know, mix it around a bit and whatever, so that everything gets Even exposed, right? Absorbed. Yeah, so all the spices or whatever gets absorbed or, you know, that the meat is covered with the spices and the, the salt reaches all, you know, the pieces of meat equally to extract, you know, the excess fluid. And after about 12 to 24 hours, we will take this from, it will create a bit of a brine, like I said, the, the fluid will be extracted. Then we will remove the meat from that juices or the brine, and we will just shake the spice, well, the excess salt what and whatever off. We are not going to uh, put it in a vinegar brine again, you know, to wash it off. Um, like some other recipes say, and we're not going to scrape or wash the salt off. We're just going to shake it loosely off so that everything comes off. And then from there we hang it. That is basically the true traditional way to do it. No... Uh, What's it? Potassium nitrate. Some recipes will say that you need to that you need to add potassium nitrate or salt saltpeter salt pe uh, yeah. salt peter salt peter whatever you call it. It's potassium nitrate. It's a chemical that lends a red color to the meat, but it's actually what fertilizer and gunpowder is made of. Rocket fuel. So stay away from that. This is true salt, true spices and me. That's it. No other funny chemicals and stuff that's going to ruin your health. I'll rather stick with the natural way. So in about 12 to 24 hours, we'll see how the process is going. Then we will take you through the process of hanging up the bolton and how you can do it. I will also, you know, create a plan if you want to create your own bolton dehydrator. I'm going to use a, a small little um, dehydrator, but you don't need it. You can just hang it in a well-ventilated place somewhere where there's a bit of a draft or a wind that can blow over it. If you want to put a fan on it, that will help a lot. And normally, bolton has been made in the winter months where there's no flies or you know other bugs around you know and they used to hang it under a, you know the shade of a tree in a cool place um the bolton maker or dehydrator that i'm using is made specifically for bolton
Good evening and welcome back to One Step at a Time Farmstead. Um, I'm Lucas and I'm so happy that you are with us tonight. And again, uh, Daniel is joining us in the kitchen tonight as we continue on our traditional bolton. But before we get to that, I actually didn't realize yesterday. Today is New Year's Eve and we've been up and down in the garden. Just she was busy baking cakes. It's his birthday. It's my birthday as well. And we had two, well, three Sweet. new three new births, births on the homestead as well. Lucian's, you know, the legend himself. Lucian's chicks hatched today. Well, three of them so far. The fourth one is busy hatching. Cracking the Yeah, the shells cracked and all that. The mother in kicked one egg out yesterday though and and then there's another four uh, eggs that should still hatch either tonight or tomorrow. tomorrow. So maybe we've got some New Year's Eve babies and some New Year's babies but we we'll see. So on the note of it being the end of the year, the last day of the year, um, I just want to remind you as well to reflect back on your year. Your tail is in the camera. Just reflect back on the year and uh, uh, the challenges that you faced and, you know, the difficult circumstances that you faced. You pressed through it and God carried you through it all. And again, it's the end of the year and you might be going through a difficult uh, period now at, the, at this uh, time of your life, in this season that you are at. Uh, but just know that God is with you. And, you know, it is also, you've got the strength within you to see it through there you know there will always be a way to get through it and sometimes that way is patience <laughs> and perseverance which isn't easy but that's sometimes the only way and if i reflect back on you know the last year that we've been at this property i mean that when we got here the timing was all wrong for our vegetable gardens and our homestead but again looking at what we accomplished and what we've learned during this past year and you know the challenges that we faced and you know the difficult circumstances that we were in it gives us joy to see that we press through it and we've learned from it and we've learned from our mistakes but we've also had those successes we had the opportunity to, to raise our broiler chickens in the most difficult time of the year the coldest uh, part of winter and with a lot of daily electrical outages up to 12 hours a day and our loss on the boilers was less than 10 percent so it gives us courage to see that we've taken on that project in the most difficult time of the year with the most difficult of circumstances and financially we were pressed as well you know to buy the chicken feed and all that sacrifices had to be made but it was an awesome success and the freezer is full of chicken well maybe not so full anymore because we've <laughs> used a lot of the chicken That's um, and we've sold a lot of live chickens so I will say pretty successful I mean with the sales we actually covered all our expenses so it was basically just gain 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 again <laughs> this uh, spring season was so mixed up messed up confusing <laughs> yeah, I mean it was extremely uh, cold the one moment and the next day it's extremely hot and I had a lot of failures and yeah, you know, I mean day by day it was, it, it, it differed, uh, the temperatures differed like night and day. I mean here in South Africa we had in certain parts of the free state, we actually had snow on the last day of October and the 1st of November, which is like summertime snow in South Africa. So yeah, the season was really a challenge and I struggled with my garden, but we persevered and we kept on and I mean now the harvest is slowly starting to come in, but at a stage I nearly gave up and luckily I've got a wonderful supporting wife that just kept on encouraging me and said okay, but just stick with it, stick with the plan. And again, I want to encourage you, no matter where you are at, you know, in your life at the 
this moment. If it's challenges on the homestead uh, or on the farm, or if it's challenges financially in your relationships, in your spiritual life, in your emotional life, you know, embrace, it's, it sounds wrong, but embrace the season that you are in because you, there's so much that you learn from it and it's there's so much growth that goes on in that period of, of your life which only which is only beneficial to you in the long run so on that note we can congratulate you on overcoming 2023 and remind you to look at the growth and the development that you went through the new skills that you developed the new relationships that you formed the community that you build the support structure and we can also bless you and wish you blessings for 2024 and wish you a prosperous 2024 in the new year okay and with that said we will now continue sorry i didn't realize yesterday that today is going to be new year's eve even though i knew it was going to be my birthday <laughs> I don't know. I didn't plan. It's December is touch and go. You know, the whole time you're busy with everything and it's family. It's it's our growing season here in South Africa. So you're always busy either in the garden or mowing the lawn or, you know, working on working on certain things. And I mean, I've got a backlog of videos that I need to edit still. But I mean, we did take the time off and I don't apologize for that at all mm. i believe being present and having your full undivided attention with your family for a week over christmas period and i mean your extended family is is so important and i don't think that we need to i believe that you guys will understand the value that we put on family life at the end of the day because that is what we are working to to foster and develop our deeper relationships with our family Absolutely. and friends yeah and also to be truly there with them for the period of time that you see them because you don't see them every single day of the year and i trust that you guys will agree and respect our perspective and value mm -hmm. on you know on that time even though when we got back it's touch and go and you know everything needs your attention all over the place um and we truly want to pick up our uh, youtube channel and everything that we're doing and share that with you guys but there's a lot going on and we don't film too much of it because we are so busy i mean just being gone from home for a week and you get back to an overgrown garden because you it was just that week that you couldn't mm -hmm. keep your your thumb on it but that takes time and i mean to put out another video where you know i mow the lawn or where i weed the garden is it's going to be a bit boring i think because you know i think you've seen it many times <laughs> already but anyway long story short so yes yesterday i started with the bolton uh, mostly because of maybe from a place of I won't say anger, anger's not the right word, but people sharing recipes as the traditional one, which isn't really the traditional right. way that it was done in the olden days. And I know that tradition comes by family practice and what you learn from, you know, the previous generation. Um, and everybody is free to develop a recipe which, you know, they like and their family enjoys and that becomes a family recipe recipe and tradition but again to say okay this is where Bolton came from and if in the first place got you know the history completely wrong and set in second place the recipe you know as the traditional OG original Bolton recipe and it's actually a, an adapted family recipe that's actually why I decided to, to do the Bolton recipe to sh actually show the correct olden way that it was done during the food trackers uh, when or when the Dutch uh, settlers settled in Cape Town in South Africa. So yeah, yesterday we shared the recipe with the salt and the coriander and black pepper and we turned it every now and then it's now about 18 hours later so i left it more than the 12 hours but it doesn't matter and we turn it okay not do i won't say every six hours but probably every more or less 
six to eight hours mm -hmm. we turned it okay and from here a lot of people will share in their recipe that it should be rinsed off in a vinegar solution and then spiced with only coriander and pepper or other spices but not salt and that's truly not the correct way i would say not the correct way but it's not the original traditional way what we will do from here let's first show you what happened here is so what's going on here is the rock salt actually extracted some of the moisture from the meat and then basically dissolved in the moisture to form a brine, which you can basically see, oh, see there okay. in the corner. All the, yeah, from all the blood that's been extracted from the meat and then the brine that forms and then you turn it every six or so hours just to make sure that every part is coated and that all the salt you know is eventually dissolved okay and what we will do from here is to remove the steaks from the brine basically and we will shake as much as we can you know this spices or whatever off or if you like it more salty you can leave it on okay i will lightly shake but but again all the salt has been dissolved so there's actually no salt to shake off at this moment like you do with you know a cured ham but you know yeah the recipe says to shake off the salt if there's any salt crystals left but what's left on here is uh, coriander and pepper okay so i'll ask my wife how she likes it do you like a lot of the coriander and spice on should i hang it like this or should i try and remove i think hang it like this when it dries some of the excess will anyway fall off. fall off yeah so i think leave it as is okay and as it dries the excess will fall off and you've still got spice on okay your meat. okay and then basically when you remove it and you shake off the excess salt so basically when you remove your steaks basically from that brine or from the salt and you shake off the excess salt you will then hang it okay in the olden days bolton was primarily made in winter times and they would hang it under trees and sorry the wind would uh, uh, basically blow over it or blow dry. a draft yeah well you know they'll hang it somewhere in the open where there's a bit of a draft or you know wind blowing over it and and it would dry and it would take depending on the thickness of the cut take about a week or so maybe sometimes two weeks maybe sometimes less than a week to dry out and cure and then they would uh, store it away on farms typically they would hang it up you know either in the um, pantry what we call a spence it was normally a you know a big room in the farmhouse where you know your preserved goods and everything was stored so they would take it from the roof rafters uh, uh, um, take a piece of wire and but spun an angles Okay, so in the olden days, you know, in the old farmhouses, in the pantry, they would thread a wire from the one roof rafter to the next, and then make hooks that you thread through the bolton and hang it on those wires, and um, that's how it was kept. And it would be dry, or, or it would be dried in the barn, but where there's a bit of air flow, because it's the air that actually dehydrates and dries dry cure your meat at the end of the day it's not heat although in the western cape where they've got a bit more of a humid climate they would let a lamb burn just to dry out the air but there would still be air flow over the meat to basically then cure the meat what we do in our modern days is we've got we built bolt-on boxes or bolt-on dryers as we call it which works a lot in the same way than a dehydrator and it's just that basically a box and then you'll have a fan somewhere either on the side or at the top mostly that basically extracts the air and then and at the bottom of the box on the sides window screen as ventilation holes okay with the window screen uh, or fine me wire mesh so that you know flies and other bugs won't come in and it would then circulate or pull the air through and over the bolt on to dehydrate it in that way okay and that's actually uh, gave us the opportunity to make bolt all year around and especially 
especially in humid places like where we've got a wet summer so there's more humidity in the air during summer to let a globe then burn just to dry out the air while it's circulating so i just want to show you one of you know basically a simple and modern small bolt-on box that we've got here this guy oops at the lid you can use a globe it's not necessary it's only to dry out the air if you know there's um, some humidity in the air so i will use it because it's our humid summer it's actually rain kind of raining quite now it's very overcast and the air is humid and then we've got an extractor fan that will draw the air through the bolting box at the bottom of the bolting box i don't know if you can see that at the bolt the bottom of the bolton box we've got these little slots cut in where air can flow through on all sides but uh, flies and other bugs won't come in then also at the top part inside the box um, we've got these little dowels and slots that go into like this instead of wire and then we can hang the bolt on, on this hook and over on you know these little dowels that's in here but i'm also going to design and make a printable design plan where you can bolt your own bolt on box or even if you've got an old cupboard that you can basically convert into a bolt on dryer or dehydrator i mean the wool is your oyster you can build it the way that you want want to but i'm going to design an easy diy bolt on dryer box and also a bolt on slicer or gelatine 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 sorry <laughs> okay so let's quickly do this so we put it a hook through the bolt on like that um, any excess moisture or salt you can shake off and then when you hang it just make sure that it doesn't touch the sides or any other pieces of bolt on meat as well The way Daniel hung it now, she took one piece and she put it through the smaller end and the next piece through the bigger end uh, of the meat cut so that it won't touch when you hang it next to each other. Make sure it's away from the sides, that it doesn't touch the sides or that it do doesn't touch each other. Um, and so you avoid any mold. Okay, and just to give you an idea, this is all the leftover brine after the bolton has been in the salt for about 18 hours. So as you can see, this is how our bolt on is hanging, just from another angle. See the space between them and nothing is touching the sides or anything like that. And when we put the lid on, also your glow, it will give off a bit of heat. So make sure that if you uh, use a globe that you don't use LEDs, but a normal uh, allergen uh, glow, <clears throat> and it will just go over there, making sure that it doesn't touch any bolt on. So I'm just going to put this next to the microwave and plug it in and let the drying process start. It's very bright in the camera. <laughs> As you can see, this sucks in air from the bottom, from, you know, the air holes here, and it gets extracted at the top. And that's 
basically all that a biltong box is. Uh, just something where you can hang your biltong in to keep cats, dogs away from and just let air basically run over it to dry it. So that is our video from our kitchen, out of the kitchen or from the kitchen. What's the playlist again? In the kitchen. In the kitchen. To show you how to make your very own true traditional biltong. Once again, thank you for spending time with us tonight. I hope this is something that you enjoy. We love you and we bless you. See you again. See you again and have an awesome new year. Bye. <laughs>